Hope everybody has had a wonderful time in Williamsburg and um, a wonderful time at this meeting. Um, I'm David Cattell Gordon. I'm director of telehealth operations at the University of Virginia, Karen S. Ruban Center for Telehealth. Hooray, best job on the planet, um, and really thrilled to be here. I want to take just one second here at the beginning of our discussion um, to just give a shout out to the folks who put this meeting together. Uh, Kathy and Anita and company, just to give them a round of applause for the work they've done. And a special shout out to this woman who we all adore. We all know who she is and, and the difference she has made um, in a very short period of time. The concept of convergence and the decision to use that as our organizing principle um, is, is a strong concept. It began yesterday with Steve North residing on Aho Creek, and we all know that's from where he's from. Um, and those, counting those tributaries uh, into those rivers, um, really was, that guy spent some time thinking about our region and, and what we contribute to a whole. And, and so it's really exciting to have this as the wrap up for what we are doing because I am about to introduce the Ohio River, the Kanawha River, the, the friggin' Susquehanna, <laughs> um, because these guys are guys who have taken advantage of all of these tributaries to move their platforms to being major rivers of enterprise level telehealth. And I just want to assert at the beginning, um, you may be on a small FQC, you may be a school-based program, you may be a private pediatric practice on a small tributary with telehealth. But listen this morning to these gentlemen because their experience of launching huge enterprise-wide telehealth system can inform each one of us in terms of process, in terms of technology, in terms of the demands of ROI, and in terms of what are the values that drive us forward to build this. So I am very, um, very, very honored to introduce Antonio Abito. Um, from, he's a colonel in the U.S. Air Force um, who has driven, well, well, I'll let him tell his story because it's extraordinary. Um, and Dennis Strong, who, um, all we have to say is those two small words, Kaiser Permanente, and we have that sense of that big hole and the story that they've had in Enterprise. Um, and Judd Hollander, um, who, woke up one morning and had a massive telehealth program in his back pocket. <laughs> um, and so we're going to hear from these gentlemen. First, if you would tell briefly the story of the launching of your enterprise. Antonio. Uh, yes, thank you, David. Uh, representing the Potomac River, <laughs> <laughs> which I live just a couple blocks from in Old Town Alexandria, just up river from George Washington's Mount Vernon. I'm a family practice physician, 25 years on active duty, uh, but I also dabble in medical informatics. And uh, I dare say that this um, high-backed, leather-bound, throne-like chair probably imparts and conveys more authority than I deserve. <laughs> but I sh I'll endeavor to uh, give my story, which is in keeping with the metaphor of convergence. Um, David suggested that I'd, uh, what is it like for a family practice doc who well, in some respects is kind of like an old style country doc because you have a captured population, you're usually in a remote setting, off by yourself, kind of a small town atmosphere when you're at a remote military base. And what are all the touch points that, uh, that, that I feel in the clinic that telehealth sort of reconnects me to the world so I'm not just an island out there? Um, and so I jotted down a few notes. Um, if I could just take you through quickly uh, what it feels like um, 
the new practice, which is different than 25 years ago when I started. And um, it starts with the patient is at home and uh, they have uh, wireless, you know, biometric devices doing patient, you know, remote home monitoring or remote patient monitoring, as we've seen in one of the exhibits out in the exhibit hall. Uh, quite a few vendors are in that. And so if it's a diabetic patient, a complicated diabetic patient, we have uh, remote home monitoring going on. Uh, and the devices are synced in through a patient portal, and it comes in to the nurse manager who can uh, respond in real time, same day turnaround. And, the, and then my nurse has already communicated with that patient with secure messaging, and, uh, or a phone call, or email. Um, and then that patient may, uh, in fact, want to make an appointment to see me anyways, in which case the patient goes into their patient portal and they request an appointment, and they make an appointment online. And then we get to the point where the patient is, uh, I actually come into the clinic, and uh, be before I even start my day, my technicians have already scrubbed the list. They've looked at the day's menu, and they realize that some of these patients just have some simple follow-ups. All, all it requires is a video chat. So they, they save them the, tra the, you know, the tyranny of trying to drive in rush hour traffic around the National Capital Region to come see me. And instead, they can just get a virtual video visit at home. And then the ones who actually need to see me, that's now freed up more patient access available appointments for my day in the clinic. Um, and then when I finally walk in and actually see my first patient, I'll sit down and I'll actually use an electronic health record. Um, I might use one of any five different electronic health records that we have, depending on who that patient belongs to, the VA, the DOD, somebody downtown in a shared partnership at a university medical center, whether that patient is a deployed patient or a guard or a reservist. Um, but all those electronic health records are all there. I don't need to you know, do, search through the files for paper anymore. Um, and my tech has already screened that patient in terms of uh, doing a back check on, on all the EHRs. So are there immunizations up to date? Have they done all their prevention screening and whatnot? So by the time I actually sit down with them, I can just concentrate on, because all the housekeeping's been done. Uh, and then if I need to order anything on that patient, I have order entry at my fingertips. So I can order entry, computerized, you know, laboratory, send them off, pharmacy, send them off, even send them downtown to outside pharmacy through order entry or um, order laboratory uh, radiology. At the same time, I, I have access to the lab rat and farm, uh, all the results right there at my fingertips. And um, I may in fact, for instance, send somebody down the hall to get a radiology uh, study done. I'll order it, but there's no radiologist in the building. So I can do a, you know, a quick wet, wet read myself, but probably within the hour, near real time, I'll have a radiologist somewhere else in the cloud, so to speak, a radiologist who's on call in our virtual radiology group, which is global in nature, uh, give the, uh, the official interpretive report, and that'll come back to me. And it'll just pop up on my screen. And um, meanwhile, the patient is, is on their way. They're, they go down to the pharmacy. The, the medicines are ordered, ready, waiting for them. Lab technicians ready with the order. And then after the appointment, Perhaps I needed a consultation. I'm just a single family practice doc. There's nobody else around. I don't have specialists. I'm not in a big medical center. Um, I have nobody to curbside, so to speak. So I would go on to the global teleconsultation portal. And we have one where I can, I can reach out to a specialist wearing a uniform anywhere in the world. Whoever's on call for the day will answer my call. And I can do, either do it on an emergent basis with an advisor, which is basically a 1-800 specialist hotline. And they will answer the phone. But if it's just something where I just need an answer, say, within 24 hours, by the end of business, that kind of thing, I'll just send it asynchronously through this uh, web-based portal. And then the answer will pop back to me. And while I'm on there sending out a new console, I'll look to see if the ones I sent from yesterday are there. And perhaps a teledermatology console has come back. A dermatologist has, rec has recommended doing a biopsy, for instance. Um, and then, <coughs> Let's say lastly, uh, it's not an emergent consult. It's not a same day, 24-hour consult, but it's something with chronic disease management. 
something where I'm going to see this patient back in a couple weeks. They're my patient. I, I just would like to get some disease, disease management strategies. I'd like to run it by an endocrinologist, say I'm one of my complicated brittle diabetics. So then what I'll do is I'll just I'll get on the uh, Project Echo site. And um, for those of you not familiar with it, it's basically virtual grand rounds and for chronic disease management. And I'll, I know that I can tune in on Friday at noon Eastern when we do our global telecast and we broadcast diabetes. Uh, complicated management, and I'll just I'll send in uh, this patient's profile on a on a template so that they they're ready. So when I tune in on Friday, I'll have my answer. So there's another example of doing a teleconsultation in a less urgent way. So those that's just sort of a typical day uh, as a family practice doc, as an outpatient clinic, where uh, you can see how many different touch points. And I had to write them down because uh, David made me think about exactly how many different touch points it is. It, it comes to 27 different software platforms that I have a user name and password for. Um, I may use just one, the EHR, for a patient, but, I, but for some patients I may use any or all of those combinations over the course of the day. And um, so which brings us to the challenges and the, uh, of that, but we can save that when we come yeah. back around again in terms of what all that means. <clears throat> I, I, th I think I'm going to recommend a 28th, and you need a behavioral health platform. Very nice. <laughs> you can see that convergence, right? We counted, we counted streams and rivers yesterday, actually, in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and, and that's a powerful convergence. We sometimes think of, I want an enterprise system that has one green button. Uh, he has 27 different logins and passwords. It's still convergence, right? Um, and it shows you the scope of an enterprise because what you describe is a global platform for the U.S. Air Force. Um, that could be the experience of anyone in uniform, correct? Right. And I also want to point out that I'm not speaking just on behalf of the Air Force. The Army and the Navy also have very robust telehealth programs. I have a counterpart in each of those services. And in fact, this year, the three of us are, three services, Army, Navy, Air Force, are all coming together as a single medical service. Under the, under the rubric of the DHA, the Defense Health Agency, and we will, we will come together and be a shared office, a single virtual health office for the DHA. Bunny Kane. Um, um, one of the things my colleagues ask is let questions percolate along the way here too for us so that um, we really want to have interchange, uh, active interchange at the end too, to be able to come to the mic and have a, a discussion too of the ideas that are, that are, are streaming forward here uh, apparently now from the Potomac and you get to pick your river, uh, Dennis, but um, for Kaiser too, the contrast to um, what you just heard in terms of how you have put an enterprise system together. Thank you, David. Um, I kind of have a little personal story of a, a convergence. Uh, my name is Dennis Trong. I'm an emergency physician. I've uh, been with Kaiser Permanente for about nine years now. Um, also an Air Force vet. He probably could have been my boss sometime in the past. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel your pain. That was, uh, we, the convergence is that you know, I, was, I was in Air Force overseas, and uh, we, I was overnight doc. Overnight, there's only one doctor on. The ER doctor always gets the short straw. And then in the daytime, you have your surgeon, you have your radiologist, you have the whole gamut. So at nighttime, back in 2007, I uh, had to use a WebEx type thing in order to consult with my friends up at Nellis Air Force Base or Andrews Air Force Base in the States while I was overseas with the time difference. That way your colleagues that were overseas with you can sleep while you're using teleconferencing to, uh, to consult with your, your friends and colleagues over in, um, over in, in the U.S. So that was my first touch with telemedicine back in, back in those days, and it's lovely to see how, how much you guys done with this. It's really uh, amazing. And Judd Hollander is actually, I don't know if many of you guys know this, he's a, um, as an ER physician, um, I, all the books, the research, the cardiac uh, uh, teaching I got, this guy was like the man. He was the cardiac guru I saw in one of the magazines that they called you before. So it's, it's, very, it's an honor to be up here with these gentlemen uh, to speak about this. Uh, as far as Kaiser Permanente, I don't know many of you guys know Kaiser, but um, we stretch eight regions, uh, 200,000 employees, over 22,000 physicians, um, 400 medical office buildings, uh, 40 hospitals. So every day we have to make it work somehow across these eight regions. 
You're talking about everything from California's up to the Mid-Atlantic on this side, um, for you this side. So for us, um, our story is actually kind of humble beginnings. It's really shocking to think about Kaiser Permanente being this big, gigantic organization that has a humble beginning when it starts to tell medicine. Um, we started back in 2012, and it really, as an emergency physician, I was actually at the call center as a clinical lead, which just means, you know, you ever guys know call centers? The scripts and protocols that drive how the patient interacts on their, uh, on their algorithm through the system. And then when they need a disposition, it goes to one of my ER physicians at the very end, and this nurse usually calls us and says, well, patient has this, this, and this, what would you like to do with them? So we sent the call center, and we found out that my boss, um, Jody Crane, who's actually with Team Health now, he came up to me one day and he goes, Dennis, there are a lot of people in the waiting rooms that probably don't need to be here in the ER or in the urgent cares. Um, we gotta do something about this. And I was like, well, what do you wanna do? <laughs> You're the boss? He goes, well, just gotta think of no solution. You know, think outside the box. I'm like, why don't you just hire more people? That's kind of the usual uh, answer. Build more buildings, right? That's the Kaiser way, we have the money for it. He goes, no, 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 we, we, we gotta figure out another way. So the next day he comes up to me, he goes, hey, you wanna try something called telemedicine? And this is like seven years ago, and I'm like, it sounds pretty cool. This technology sounds kind of sexy. What's my budget? And he goes, zero. <laughs> I'm like, come on, this is Kaiser Permanente. <laughs> zero? He goes, no, we just gotta figure out. I mean, I could choose some headphones or a camera or something like that, but just, just use what you got and see what we can do, All right? So it starts out, that's probably the best gift I ever had from a boss. It says, no budget, you just go deal with it, right? So then you start thinking, you start thinking about what if. What, what can I do with all these Lego pieces of Kaiser Permanente? You think about, well, I run a call center, so the calls that come in, you can change the script and protocols to drive the patient, right, right care, right time, right place, to video visits. So we start thinking about that. We go, well, they call in, and then you, you can book them through our electronic medical record system. We have KP Health Connect, the largest civilian EMR in, in the country. Why don't we book them into one of these scheduled video visits? And then you can get these physicians that do these dispositions to sit on the other side and you know, go to Best Buy, get them some headphones, get some cameras, um, and set them up with the computer. And you know, you, when you want to, when you have a scheduled appointment, you send them a link. We use WebEx at the time, so that's what we use for meetings. So we're like, hey, just send them a link, and they'll get on, and we'll have like, one of our uh, telephone service reps kind of uh, model as a support staff, and we'll get them on. And that was how telemedicine began video visits for uh, Kaiser Permanente, because that simple solution that costs barely anything um, started out in Mid-Atlantic, where I'm at in uh, Virginia, D.C., Maryland area, and that was 2012. Fast forward seven years, and through the, our eight regional uh, governance uh, group that we formed later on, every region uses the same model now that we used. It's the same support structure, same, same technology, everything is all the same. We don't use WebEx anymore, by the way. <laughs> We changed, <laughs> we, we, we've evolved. But uh, it just shows that you, know, you can start small and as long as it's, it's intentional, it's actionable, and just being resourceful, I think that's what has really helped us as an organization start grasping the fact that you can't, can't keep on spending for healthcare to get better anymore. You start you guys think smarter about it. So that's where I think our uh, organization you know, we started doing video visits, and you know, we have this great platform now, uh, the kp.org, the patient portal. Uh, we've really capitalized on the fact that our EMR is a backbone, you know, where the data is, it's the backbone of our system, where the patient information is. So between all that, that's kind of just a quick short story letting you guys know how kind of humble beginnings, and I think that's where many of us kind of are or, or, or have been, and just really, you know, you really have an opportunity from there to really do whatever you want. You just gotta use your resources right. So this is an interesting flow from the experience of the individual provider and the patient and applying that to a large, robust system or the work in a call center to try to say, hey, well, we can figure that out. Um, this is where we've all been. And a perfect segue to Judd to describe the birth of telehealth at Thomas Jefferson. So, so I had what all of you have when you began your telehealth program. I had a CEO come to me and say, grow a telehealth program. I, I, I sort of have the great advantage that I was not judging in a back room conceiving of a telehealth program coming out with this new idea and needed to convince everybody. I, I was actually hired specifically to grow a telehealth program. 
and my background in telehealth was the same as yours when you were four years old. I, I knew <laughs> virtually nothing, um, which, which was really a very great starting point because what it forced me to do was learn from others. A and so I think educational lesson number one for Jefferson was develop a strategy. I didn't even know enough to entertain a vendor, so if a vendor knocked on my door and wanted to talk to me, I wouldn't even know what I was talking to them about, which turned out to be a great thing because the wrong way to do anything is to begin by a vendor selling you a product for something that you have no need for by them convincing you you have a need for it and it's gonna solve your problem that you never had in the first place. So we, we went around and said, okay, I don't really know what telemedicine is, you, you know, but let's assume that it's an audio video visit of some type that you could do with somebody and you have a problem that you need to solve. And, and we engaged everybody in the enterprise, the patients, the families, the caregivers, the doctors, the administrators, and said, you know, give us a couple problems that you think we may be able to solve with telemedicine, whatever the heck it is you consider telemedicine to be, put a bunch of stickies on the wall, coalesced them around a, a couple of different use cases, developed a strategic plan, and rolled out a strategy. And, and the nice thing is that literally, it's the CEO and president of the health system and now the university and the board that hired a group of us to do this. And my initial conversation, I hear this is taped, so I have to water down the words a little bit. <laughs> but, but, but specifically, what I was really told when I walked in and asked the budget question, I didn't get a zero. I got a, I can't really answer that directly for you, but here's the assumptions you should work with. Assume you have $100 million. I don't give, a, 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 I, 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 what was it? Oh, I don't, I don't give a crap whether you fail and go do something that's freaking cool. And crap and freaking were imputed words, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and that was it. And I said, okay, but now really, I'm gonna have to spend some money, so where do I spend it from? He says, spend it from my account and come back and ask for more after you spend a million and a half. Like, right? Wouldn't you love to have that problem? That was a pretty good problem to have. On the other hand, there's real expectations to grow it out, so we needed to solve all the problems. So we launched, unlike anybody else, we just started four and a half years ago, and we were all in on everything that was gonna solve a strategic problem for the institution. So we have a big, you know, nice circle of life, we call it, of all the programs we have. But it breaks down pretty simple. Before I got there, we had a big provider-to-provider -provider neurosurgery network. So provider-to-provider -provider is one use case. We have consumer and provider. We have an on-demand 24-7 app that you could do in our system, outside of our system, as long as you're in the territories we covered. And we rolled out a scheduled visit program to every specialty known to mankind and effectively had the, the chutzpah from above to incentivize people to do this across every specialty. So the challenge was actually keeping up, and in the first six months, we actually trained about a thousand people, providers, to be doing telemedicine calls, and we had about four or five hundred of them doing it. So our, our challenge was scaling, and, and I think our take-home points are, it's always strategy first. If you're discussing what you're doing and you don't have it fitting in your strategy, you, you got a big mistake from the beginning. The second take home point, if, if you're not the military or you don't own the payers, the providers, the doctors, and the risk, there is no ROI. If someone's coming in and telling you the ROI on this program is positive, find somebody new. There just is an ROI. It's about downstream revenue. And our talking point around the institution is, it's a lot like Epic. What's your ROI on Epic? It's a cost of doing business. It's a lot like the third floor of your hospital. It doesn't have a better ROI than the fifth floor of your hospital, but you don't have a hospital without a third floor, so you need it. We believe that fundamentally, the healthcare delivery system is changing. It's moving towards telemedicine and digital health, and if we're not playing, we're no longer taking care of people. And so our ROI is staying alive. It's like breathing. And it's just what we're going to do. And I had the advantage of being in a place that thought like that and, and still thinks like that to a large degree, getting to grow out the programs. Isn't it amazing to hear those three stories and to realize that all three of you and the, the organizations that you are within have come to the same or are a very similar place very quickly, I might add. Uh, yours may be at a longer grind. Um, 
but this has been a rapid progression because I can look out here and I know a number of folks who've been at this at tw for 20 years and we're still sort of grinding forward. So you've reached this moment that the decision's getting made. And so I want to go back to you, Judd, and then come back across. You got to make a decision in there about technology, right? Uh, like all the folks out here, I think what you said about the vendor, if you got somebody who's solving your problems for you and you don't know what that problem is, um, you're going to make a mistake. So how did you solve those problems about which technology to apply? So, so I'm going to not directly answer your question. I'm going to answer how I would solve the problem now okay. because I have some learnings over time. The, the first is there's a quote that is attributed to Colin Powell that, that's called the 40-70 rule that I, I totally love, which is if you don't get 40% of the information, you're going to make a bad decision. If you wait for more than 70, they're going to invade and kill you first. As an ER doc, and you'll notice, you know, Dr. Nick talking yesterday, ER doc, Dennis here, ER doc, me, ER doc, we live in the 4070 world, like people roll through the door and, and I can't get all the information. So, so I sort of either have a skill set or a dysfunction that allows me to be pretty good at growing out new programs where I, I, I can't get all, all the information. So it's a matter of getting enough. Right now, what we do, we have an eight-page single-space spec sheet of what we want for some of our products. Um, and then we go around and look for products that could do that. And if you can't do it, we look for products that promise to do that. We, we have a couple rules. It's not the zero budget, but I frankly can't see any reason for any segment of your program you would ever spend more than 150 or 200,000 on a product. There are people who will come, and if you promise you could do A, B, C, and D, you're lying on at least three of the four things, and you probably don't even do A well. So, you, you know, telehealth is a lot like EMRs were a long time ago, 27 passwords to get everything done. Someone's coming in and telling you, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. Don't believe them. Get behind the marketing. Don't actually listen to what people say marketing other than to give you an idea whether there's a chance they might meet your spec list. And so what we learn to do is we force the vendor to get behind our firewall before we will entertain looking at their product. Because if you can't get before the fi behind the firewall at our institution, or your own institution, right? You all know you have problems like that. If you can't do it when you're trying to sell the product, imagine after you've purchased the product. So the biggest right. reason that we've seen with implementation delays is IT problems within our own system. So, I'm like, okay, come on, get behind our firewall and do 10 demos for me. I want to see it on a Samsung, I want to see it on an iPhone, I want to see it on a tablet, I want to see it on four different browsers. Once I've seen it on that, if it works on all of that and the video works and I could see the video and the technology works, now I could talk about whether that product's going to solve my problem and then I could start going through the spec sheet. And so to me, it is, I want to get the best deal I could get financially because, again, there's no ROI. There's two things I know with 100% certainty. If I'm buying your product for money and there's no ROI, I'm losing more money, right? That's not really hard. And the other thing I know is if you're going to sell me payer innovation, payer innovation is my favorite term. The idea of payer innovation is you spend a lot of money on a product and if you save me, the payer, some money, I'll give you a little bit of that back. No ROI on payer innovation either. So once you know that, the only way you can have good stuff is by having good people involved. It's about people and processes. It's not at all about the technology, right? And then drive down the cost of the technology. And he rolled out his program with something that was free. So ask yourself, is $500,000 worth it over the lumps and bumps of the free program, and it probably will never be. So to me, people processes first, making sure the technology truly works, don't sit in a sales room, don't do it at a conference, don't do it in their offices where it should certainly work, make them do it in the room you plan on using and see if it works. And I think if you do those things and you're solving a strategic problem, you're probably 85% of the way there. So is your system perfect? No. Okay, yeah, exactly. So Dennis, how did you guys go about solving that issue? You got no budget, 
Yeah, well, you got I finally got a budget eventually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because that budget you get, it's, it was really like an 80-20 rule where that budget was an IT budget, right? 80% of it was about technology, hardware, and 20% of it was more toward project management and strategy, which thinking back seven years uh, later now, you're like, that was kind of a stupid way to go about it. Um, but we had a paradigm shift over the years because we figured out that, you know, I agree with Jeff, it's not even about the technology. It's about the operation, about the workflow. Right. I mean, we're an integrated managed care organization. You know, we're capitated. We have the responsibility to spend our, our members' um, money appropriately, right? So a lot of it has to come down to, um, you know, we, we, have these, we have a system right, that's, that's built in. Telemedicine, well, no matter what flavor of telemedicine, video visit, email, secure message, phone, whatever it is, is an extension of this system, right? So it doesn't replace it, it's an extension of the system. So everything we do comes down to the same operational <coughs> goals and mission of the system, right? So that, that keeps our, our, um, our mission of values very, very straight. And that's where, um, even though telemedicine started out as an 80-20 IT endeavor, you know, hardware technology versus uh, project management, it's kind of flipped now. So we only spend about 20% of our, our budget on hardware, technology, those kind of things. 80% of it is actually spent on the operations, the workflows, sitting with a whiteboard. I have three whiteboards in my office. It's, you guys walk in there, it's, it's glaring. <laughs> and we, we spend all day whiteboarding things out with the IT team and with our, uh, our operational team and our clinicians. Um, so I think that's really important to that your technology come after your workflow, after your operations. You figure out what fits in there. Um, and then that's where you start thinking about the vendors. And I'm, I'm much like Judd. Um, I want to hear what a lot of vendors have to say, but I don't even, you know, I use it more of a learning point. Um, I put my KPIT director in front of them and had them kind of get me, the, give me back the feedback and let me know, well, this is my problem here. This is what my solution, this is my whiteboard. Tell me which technology fits in there so, so I can bring true value into what we're trying to do. Yeah, powerful themes there that, you know, one of the things, and I know this is probably true, Kathy, in terms of the technical assistance calls, people often lead with the technology question. Uh, it's, it's like the call that you get. And, and you, you guys have all sort of raised those questions. But what we've heard is, you know, it's not about ROI. It's about relationship. It's about strategy. And, and I think you very powerfully have said it's about alignment. If your technology and the decisions you made there are out of alignment with the use case and how you want to do it, it's not going to work. Um, Mr. Cap Colonel 27, um, for you, how, how do you guys envision the future of this, um, this huge workforce, armed services, and a technology decision to try to manage um, all those people across all those geographies and timelines and clinical issues. Yeah, for perspective, the scale of it is um, 26 medical centers, 135 medical treatment facilities and clinics, and 800 remote medical stations worldwide, all 24 time zones globally. Um, the enterprise en imaging is on order of 1.2 million digital diagnostic studies archived annually. Uh, virtual video visits just to the patient at home, just in continental United States, from 75 clinics is on the order of half a million a year. Um, but we started 10 years ago with two points, connecting a psychiatrist with a patient between two different clinics geographically separated. That was day one, and this is where we are now. Um, to echo uh, Judd's point, it starts with requirements. So technology is not always the solution to the requirement. It may in fact be. Often it is, but not always. So I start with requirements, and I bring in functional end users from the field to champion it, and they, are, they help me write the requirements document and the capabilities document. And then, then we go to industry, put out the request. Uh, so I, I turn the sales pitch around. The vendors don't pitch me. I pitch the vendors. So this is what we need. Can you build it so we can buy it? Um, 
but it starts with requirements and that's really what drives the acquisition process because uh, we're no longer in the build business of building building it within from the government at this point so it's it's all just buy it out of the box ready made powerful really and truly strategy alignment requirements um, for all of us we all share that whether we're archiving 1.5 million images <laughs> a year or whether we've got 350 patients in an FQHC in a rural community. Um, and so that sets the base for it. You, we've heard about starting day one, patient one, and doing it. You know, There is no instant scalability in this, right? You have to do it, you have to figure it out, and then you have to build the relationships to get it done. You use technology in the wise way to meet your requirements. How important in this setting then, given that context, are the values and the leadership that drive this in that equation? Dennis, what do you think about that in terms of leadership and the decision to make this go? Oh boy, uh, leadership for us has been, uh, change management has been, been the most interesting part of, of this whole thing. I mean, we, I mean, when we trained, we trained in a different world, right? And then now it's, it's the technology is everywhere. Everyone's looking for convenience. We're self-service uh, or uh, self-service society now. You know, everyone's on their apps, and you know, medicine has become uh, very commercialized in that way. Um, but being an or old organization like Kaiser Permanente, it's been around since 1945. We, we're good at what we do. We're good at what we do a certain way in the brick and mortar type world. Trying to evolve into the technology world with virtual care and, and digital care, it's, it's been tough because a lot of, many of your leaders are, have got there by being around for a long time. And they got there by thinking a certain way and approaching things a certain way. So change management has been the hardest thing for me and a lot of it has been just persistence. You know, persistence and, and just really being passionate about, about what you're doing and, and why you're doing it. And just going, you know, one leader at a time. And you know, it's sometimes it's a conversation in a boardroom. Sometimes it's just a conversation with coffee or, or a drink or something. And that really, that's that's most of what I've been doing for the last four years or so is at a national level with our our federation and uh, program office leadership, um, at our local leadership, just constantly pitching. And everyone has a different incentive, of course, on why they would adopt telehealth. And you you have, you have to know you have to pivot and and change your messaging based on the person you're talking to. At the end of the day, it's the same North Star. We're all trying to get the same thing, better patient care. But everyone has their own uh, metrics that they have to meet, and you try to find a way to help them meet it. And after a while, it gets kind of easier because you really do understand that we're all just trying to get, get to the same goal, and people just, they're adopting it too. I mean, seeing these kind of forms like this, some of my colleagues that are not telehealth folks, they show up to these kind of things just to check it out, and they leave with a whole different perspective on how we should be delivering care. Um, can we mandate clinicians are going to do this? Um, I would don't, we don't mean mandate it within our own organization. We, we incentivize it. Uh, we, talk about, we talk about the triple aim, right? And then it's quadruple aim. A triple aim is you know, you're trying to get high quality, great experience, and low cost. And the quadruple aim is you, you want the uh, healthcare team to have great experience also. So I'm, my physicians that were, it was like the 595 rule. Only 5% of physicians were doing all the video visits. 95% of them were still doing brick and mortar. And over time, as you start doing more of these and you see the patient feedback, they love it. And then physician feedback, they love it. The scale has started tipping, right? So now we have more 75% of our physicians do it, 25% don't. And the satisfaction rate among patients and physicians are up in the high 90s. Right? So it's really a win-win. Patients don't have to come in. You know, we can get sicker patients into our buildings. It just makes sense for us. There's a tipping point in there that in there. Point, and we, totally, we, yeah. we just went through, as, as Kathy knows, we have 37, roughly 38. Laura knows this well, my, the manager of operations, active telehealth clinics. And so we throw that number out. We're, we've done 60-some use cases, 37 active clinics. But it makes a difference when you do a count that says, well, we've got 800 docs at UVA. And if you go through and you count how many have a license to do video conference who are actively using it, and you get to a number like 347, which I think is the number we got to, you go, wow, we're getting close to something that looks like a real moment 
or people are going to use it. Mm -hmm. it you move off that 95-5 scale. Antonio, say a little bit about, you, are, you guys are about ready to make a, yet another massive turn in all of this, um, combining the services. Um, the champions there, people ready for the scale of that change? Yes, and to answer the previous question, we actually do have a mandate. Yeah. <laughs> In government <laughs> health care, uh, Congress has actually mandated. They actually call it, entitle it a mandate. It's the, uh, the, the NDAA, National Defense Act of 2017, with a congressional mandate to expand and emphasize and maximize the use of telehealth in the DOD and the VA in particular, but also in the, our other government sister healthcare services, the Indian Health Service and the uh, Public Health Service. So in keeping with that then, the answer to your second question, um, the DHA, this combined joint construct is supposed to go towards emphasizing that, eliminating the duplicity and the redundancies and bringing, bringing best practices of each of the service legacy programs together and making everything enterprise-wide. And by enterprise, I mean across the DOD and VA, worldwide. Something we especially should be proud of um, as people who have pioneered in this industry, in this room, um, that, that you guys have made this turn to have this full level of integration to reach everyone inspired by values to do the best you can do in all of this. And so, Judd, I wonder if in this value question and leadership, um, you clearly, even though you had to modify the language, had a, um, had a critical moment in, in having values drive the decision more important than technology, right? More important than anything was that value commitment. Right, and, and so, you know, clearly up top having that was huge, but as I reflect back on our rollout, right, my, my job is execution. At the end of the day, we're either taking care of patients and doing something good for patients or, or we're not. And, and when we debated the, the approach up front, and, and we've changed, and I think it's worth people seeing the course, the first hire, my first you, you know, director or project manager who worked with me was Kate Fuller, who many of you know is, is now at CHOP. And, and Kate was specifically hired because she didn't have an IT background, but she was a people person. She was a regional manager of a sales force. At that time was Oracle, so she understood the IT words, but that wasn't her role. And we were gonna do change management and we thought, Who's going to help do change besides somebody who's got a nice personality that people like, who could see the vision and could actually speak enough of the language to make it happen, but not do that? O over time, as the program grows, Frank Seitz, who's sitting over there, is now the overall director for telemedicine, and, and we ended up with, oh, well, what do we need next? Well, we need somebody who can micromanage the spreadsheets and take each thing that we need to do and drop it into 37,000 Excel rows and project manager Adam McAconia, who was at this meeting but may have left already, was the guy we hired to do that. So much like our strategy and what are we trying to accomplish, we were actually strategic in how are we going to have the right people and processes in place to make that happen and roll that out. Um, and, and so I, I think that was, it turned out to be reasonably smart and let us do that. But yet, I will take the blame for a big fail on our end. Um, I, I was a competitive tennis player early in life, and one of the great things they say about tennis in doubles, you win by making your weakest partner stronger. So our original rollout, we actually mandated from Clasco level, our CEO, that every provider in the system do at least 12 calls in a year, one a month, easy thing, or they weren't gonna get their incentive. Well, as you know, when you mandate things, a third of people jump on the bus, a third of people pretend to jump on the bus, and a third of people find one out of 10 fingers that they're willing to share with you. And, 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 you know, and, and that's exactly what, what happened. And, and then you're left with, well, because somebody didn't do telehealth, we're really gonna dock their pay, and so we didn't do it, so it was an empty threat. And the next year, we tried a new incentive, we put it on the chairs to make it work in their department, but there was you know, no real financial consequences 
to, to make that happen. And we have extraordinarily detailed metrics. Every month, every chair and service line leader gets a report of every physician in their group, how many calls they've done. We give them two options this year and how they can meet their metrics at the end. They don't have to declare it, they just gotta meet one of the two. But this year, after hearing, oh, we're rewarded in our comp plan from fee for service, we don't get value-based care, so why should we do this? We said, okay, well, we're now gonna make it hit your bottom line. So the chair's discretionary fund for real this year, which can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, if they don't hit the telehealth metrics, they lose 50% of their chair discretionary funds. Let me tell you, our volume of calls <laughs> is starting to go up as they get closer to the end of the year. And about half the, I'd say two months ago, a third were tracking where they would make it. Right now, a half of them are tracking where they should make it. The other half are sort of panic-stricken, looking at ways to get there. It works out nice, and the chairs lose 12.5% of their own personal incentive. Wow. We're still gonna miss on probably 25% of departments. You, you know, with some excuse, and I, I basically have said I'm the excuse manager. You know, I get to hear all this. And, and, and so next year, on, on the chairs that have multiple divisions that aren't making it, I'm working with them to say, put it on the division directors. There's no reason for you to incur it if a division won't do it. Pass it on down and do that. And the other thing we're doing, we put it on the chairs, but we've done a bunch of mergers at Jefferson and we've grown from a billion dollar enterprise to a six billion dollar enterprise from three to 14 and soon to be 18 hospitals. We're now putting it on the division presidents and the CMOs. So I, I've had the, I guess I'll call it advantage in education in now having to roll out four different telehealth programs because as we do these mergers, we're doing true hub and hub mergers. So it's not everybody's the boss from the mothership over all the other sites. So we've had to negotiate at each of the sites. And you know what, different things work at different sites. Depends on their culture and their employment model and how these things are. It's all logical, but until you put the incentive on somebody who controls it at the site, you can't make it work. And then I'll just come back to the throw it at everybody. One of the, one of the guys that teaches leadership out of Wharton talks about this ink blot approach. And what we did was throw it all out at the periphery and make everybody put their ink on it and hope it would coalesce. That didn't work. And his advice is, find the people in that middle third and move them up. Exactly the wrong approach to tennis. But I guess if you get somebody in their first lesson as their doubles partner, you're not gonna make them good enough to win. So bring up the people who are lagging behind but have shown some interest rather than the people who are so far behind, you really just shouldn't waste your time pushing that. So. That, that's where we're at. So even with strong leadership, the CEO doesn't do the phone calls. Yeah. The thread in all of this is the decision in your organization to believe in this vision. If you didn't believe in the vision that this is part of the future of the way we're going to deliver health care, you would never approach chairs in that way about that bottom line you would never fully integrate and invest the ultimately the dollars that Kaiser or to bring all of the armed services under one umbrella with a mandate of telehealth. That's powerful, that requires belief. Um, that's the same thing that so many of us who've come, how many years now have we come to this, Kathy? Eight. eight years. Look what these guys have done in eight years. Look what they've done in eight years and it should be uh, an inspiration to all of us, the mighty Potomac, the mighty Kanawha, and the, and the sort of- we Schuylkill. The Schuylkill, <laughs> the, if I can say it correctly, Schuylkill. Um, we've got about 10 minutes. These are powerful threads that I think we all share. So we have microphones here and we would really um, like, we'll um, start with some of these questions that are here on the board, but, but your voice is important too, so. Um, so, I am not Rob Sprang. I want to identify that as the question. Most people thought I was Rob Sprang from the University of Kentucky, but that is not true. I'm Steve North. Um, and so, um, we'll ask a question in, in the Kaiser question. What percent of your patients now see patients through, what, what percentage of patients are seen through telehealth? Um, about 50%. 
a patient seen through telehealth and one of the modalities. You know, and that's, that's the hard part to define telehealth right now. That's defined for us as secure messaging, phone, or video. Right? Um, the video portion continues to rise, uh, the other parts continue to rise. Office visits are starting to see a slight uh, decrease. So. so slowly, but so how fast, Judd? You went from zero to how many encounters? So we, we are hopeful. Um, so I tell you, this fiscal year, because I looked at the report this morning, we've done 31,000 audio video synchronous visits, which is the main part of our tele. We don't count telephone calls and email and text messaging. It, it's too impossible for us to keep track of that. So I, I think, you know, I, I don't know how we could compare to Kaiser, but we're probably going to, by the end of this fiscal year, hit 100,000 audio video visits that are done synchronously with providers. And you've got... As an outpatient, active duty, uh, family practice doc, if I have 18 patients on the docket for a day, uh, four of them will be virtual video visits to the home. And 50% of my panel of 3,000 patients have a secure messaging account. I would say only about 10% of them are active monthly users. So have you, and the three of these organizations, have you hit the tipping point now that this is where you're going with certainty? I would say we're still on the, uh, we're still crescendoing. Uh, we haven't quite got to the tipping point yet, but it just grows every year. I'd like that feeling of crescendoing. <laughs> I'm not sure we've gotten there. Yeah, it's an exciting time right now. We, we're, we're seeing that every, every region that we have is seeing an exponential increase uh, of telemedicine use. Um, and it's just that inflection point that's finally being hit. And we talked about this inflection point for the past probably three or four years. When we finally can hit that inflection point, um, our organization itself has finally hit it. And I think that was all had to do with the alignment of the eight regions to, to a common goal and a common set of standards. Um, that's the hardest part for us. I mean, we don't, we're an integrated system, but we're not like Intermountain or Geisinger, where you're very uh, localized in one area. We're spread out with their own different problems and our own different types of, um, uh, of leadership and structure, um, even though we're all kinds of permanente, still a little bit different flavors everywhere. So that alignment has actually helped us set a common set of standards across the whole uh, um, enterprise to, to reach just the same goals. And that's, that's, that's really seen where the inflection point has helped us out now. So I, I think, we're, you know, to be honest, we've got, we got a long way to go. I, I think we also have a long way to go. You, you know, what, what, what we say when we're talking to each other is we're all kind of confident and we all believe this is the future, but when we're having beers and we're really commiserating, we all got plenty of stuff to commiserate over. <laughs> um, you know, we, the, the biggest thing that we did this year, which drove visits and actually increased visits three or four fold, is, is we aligned our benefits plan with what we want for our employees. So we got, you know, 40 or 50,000 employees in dependents. We said if you call Jeff Connect first, and we say you need to go to the ER or urgent care, we will refund your ER or urgent care copay. And we drove those copays up. So by calling telehealth first, you save 250 bucks. And in fact, some people say we're even wiping out the, the copay in the hospital visit. So maybe saving 1,000 bucks if you call first. So literally, the day we announced this, our visits went up three or four fold to our on-demand service. And, and again, that was leadership from the CEO that never would have happened because he said, I don't care whether the payer says they could do it or not, we're self-insured, do it and figure it out on the back end, because otherwise they're gonna say they can't make it work technically, we're gonna wait a year and we're gonna be in the same position. So just roll it out and clean up the mess afterwards and, and, and make it work. And so we did that because to me, telemedicine is kind of like urgent care was in 1980 or 1985. You know, it was a dock in the box thing. People thought it was an inferior thing. Now there's one on every street corner. Everybody goes there, urgent care volume's growing. It wasn't top of the mind. The biggest problem I think we have in telemedicine is that patients don't think of it first. They think of everything else they do. And I think we all do well if all boats rise and we're all pushing out that telemedicine works for the things telemedicine's proven to work for. And, and it comes back to one of the things we haven't discussed which is data. We haven't discussed data and evidence-based use of telemedicine. And I don't want to make that a requirement because it's not a requirement for anything else I do in the emergency department, but the more we have data showing it works to deliver this type of healthcare for this type of patient, the more we can fight the reimbursement fight to get reimbursement if you're not in you, you, you know, something that takes care of reimbursement like Kaiser or, or the military and we'll grow it, but it's, 
top of the mind for the patient is where we need to go. And, and when we get there, I, I mean, our net promoter score is up to 90 some months. I mean, it's phenomenal, but people have to remember to use it. So how do we, how do we market this to, so that it is top of mind? I mean, Kaiser, you guys are, are master wizards at marketing some days. Yeah, we market yeah. in all different ways. I mean, just general marketing in general, but I mean, you know, some of the questions here about you call the call center, you got to build into your scripts and protocols. That's kind of our main inlet for many of our patients, the call center. Um, the KPI.org portal, whether you're on your phone or whether you're on your computer, it's, it's all there now. I mean, it's just telling you, have, have you tried a video visit? Have you tried uh, an e-visit? Have you tried a chat with a doctor? Um, we still want to offer some offer them choices because I mean just the kind of system we are if it's appropriate then they should get a choice and you know you want to e-visit because it's asynchronous you're at work you're busy right now you just want a, a response before uh, lunchtime uh, you want to chat with somebody right now you're not much of a talker you want to just kind of be sitting there chatting back and forth because we're very much a chat society or do you want a video visit you want that personal interaction with with a, a physician uh, with the next couple hours you know so they have all these choices um, but this it's just for user for the same conditions so we have to kind of develop different programs, um, but the inlets to all this, all the same to us, between the marketing and between directing patients the right way, but didn't give them choice. They feel like you're not being forced into one decision or the other, but you're still, still the same results. Um, I wonder, we have just a, a couple, of, one minute left. I wonder if there's any last uh, piece that's burning in somebody's mind that they want to ask. Uh, Dr. Selinsky, happy to see you at the microphone. Do we need to drop it some more for you? There you go. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, all of you, for coming up and telling us about your successes because it's a tremendous and very um, rewarding to hear how hard you've worked and how, how much success you've had. But on top of that, I just want to urge you touched on data. It's not only data to us who are a lot of the believers, but I really encourage you to take your successes and push it out through the healthcare finance, through health, your, your business offices, you know, their associations. And I know that you've, you've done some of that already, but this does take a village. And if you don't have the chiefs at the top, Right, really understanding the value of it, then we're we're kind of spinning our wheels to try to make that happen. But I really encourage you, again, everyone on your team should take it back to their association, professional associations, and continue to push it out because I think then we're really going to get where we want to be. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you can, very can, I, much. can I make a com yes. comment on that? Because this we, we discussed in the Pennsylvania group yesterday. Nate discussed it, I, I think, during his talk this morning, that you know, one of the things we're striving to get to is we believe this should be paid for. We fundamentally believe that if we take care of a patient and provide good quality care, the people who are taking the money from the patient offering to pay for their care should pay us for the care we, we deliver. And, and, and Nate said something that struck me that I, I, I know to be true, but I don't think we all say out loud a lot, which is when you go to the state to do these legislative things, the payers just lie. They just show up and say, we cover that, we cover this, we cover that. And, and so I've had, I, I was the dude who testified at the Pennsylvania legislature last year. And, and I watched the payers say, we cover this, we cover that. And, and the one thing the payers said that I was not prepared for is that if you submit the claim, we'll just pay for it. And, and we know that's not true. But I, I, I'm of the premise now that we in Pennsylvania, all the major academic medical centers, are now collecting the denials because nothing's more powerful than going back to the legislature and dropping 30 boxes of denials in front of them. And you all wrestle with the same things. So that's another form of data. Another form of data is your patients are paying you to take care of them and you're not following up on that responsibility. And here's my proof in a dramatic fashion with 12 million pages. And so I put this out as a plea because you, you know, we're not in medicine so that we could have boats on the Potomac or whatever river we're on. But, but if, if we're not getting paid, the margins are so small now that we're not going to be able to deliver the care that we hope to deliver. And, and it just seems unethical to me that the people who are taking massive amounts of money out of our patients' pockets aren't willing to give it back to the patients for the care they're delivering. So I'm just going to advocate one yeah, form of data is that. Um, 
Well, that's, we are out of time. This is an extraordinary way to have wrapped up Convergence. Um, I want to thank each of you, Antonio, Dennis, Judd. You are powerful voices in the work that we're doing, and we cannot say enough thank you for all that you are doing that we are all contributing to as a whole. So thank you very much. Thank them thank for their gift this morning. Happy.